To get an audience online, I would say the two things you need is consistency and authenticity. And welcome everyone to Slater Pod. Uh, hi, Esther. Hello. What's going on? What's going on? Well, I'm back for a little bit. You're back. <laughs> yeah. It's been four months only. Not much happened. Yeah, it has been four months. Well, yeah, no, maybe not in the, in some worlds, but no, my world, a lot has happened. Uh, so yeah, been on maternity leave, as I think we said when on my last, last podcast back in April um yeah I was on maternity leave for four months and also moved house for those uh looking on the video you might be able to see, notice a slightly different background than uh, than previously so yes that's that's what's new with me yeah back for a few weeks and then uh you know we'll uh tidy over the uh, a few more months where we will co-host with Anna, which uh, went great, by the way, and have uh, we always have uh, a lot of good guests on, etc. So today's guest is Adrian Probst, fellow Swiss, uh, uh, Swiss freelance translator who's based in Belgium. And he's one of the most, if not the most successful YouTuber in the freelance translation space. So he's running the channel Freelance Verse, at, has about 16,000 subscribers. So that's 16 times more than we do. And many of his videos get like 50,000 views. And that's, uh, I don't know, a hundred times more than we get. So I, I want to I wanna ask Adrian how he, uh, he does it and then, and, and then copy, copy that, right? So uh, yeah, it's really, it's really cool, really cool channel. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, so, you know, let me get you up to speed today about what's making news while you were away. Yeah, so you're you're a bit out of the loop. I mean, a lot a lot has happened. It's been you know four or five months. So I just want to kind of uh, rehash a couple of stories uh, that that were really big in my view, uh, like the YouTube story with the 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 audio multilingual audio. Then uh, there was an RWS bid interpreter strike, and I just want to get you up to speed on M and A. And then you're gonna you dug into a bit of the Inc. Five thousand list results. Uh, in the few days that you're you've been back now right so youtube staying with youtube so you know uh, because today we have adrian so i want to kick off with a, a comment on youtube so youtube has been testing this feature right that they are giving very popular uh, creators that have like hundreds of millions of views and you know millions of subscribers like mr beast um which i went down a rabbit hole it's actually fantastic videos it's insane what the guy's producing so what have they done YouTube? They've given them access to like multilingual audio, meaning you can um, add professionally dubbed audio in multiple languages to your YouTube videos, which is you know, not machine dubbing, not the allowed thing. I think that happened, yeah, they launched allowed. You remember that? I think you were, that was like early 2022. Yeah, that was going to be my question is if it's this, if it's sort of an extension of, of that, but no. No, 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 no. So if you go to Mr. Beast's channel, this is actually dubbed content by professionals, right? Which is, you know, just imagine if they scale this, if like all of the YouTube creators get the, the, the opportunity to have dubbed content. I mean, the market for dubbing would just, it would be, I mean, we, we called it, and I don't think this is exaggeration. We called it a Netflix sized opportunity for dubbing providers. But who's paying for it though? The creator. Uh, okay. I mean, if you have enough subscri uh, subscribers, it's totally worth it, right? I mean, so Mr. Beast, I mean, uh, I keep using that that uh, example with my kids, but like, I can't really watch Mr. Beast, my kids. I mean, I could, but it's just that they watch, you know, the moving engines. They don't really understand what's going on. I mean, if they dubbed it into German, I'd totally watch it. So with them, well, maybe it's, it's not, it's, it's great content, but it's maybe not like six-year-old content. Hmm. <laughs> Would I really? Yeah. No, it makes sense. And if you're obviously like a, a, I don't know, like a, you've got a certain amount of traction or a good amount of traction in one part of the world, but you think actually your content could become popular in other parts of the world, then I don't know, like Joe Rogan or somebody, you know, I'm sure he, that he would like massively benefit from dubbing. He's gone from YouTube though. Oh, oh, maybe not then. <laughs> Rogan's exclusive on Spotify now. That's right. I'd forgotten. Oh, well. Rogan type people that have like millions of subscribers and Rogan will be podcast though. So that would be super challenging. Having like a podcast properly dubbed. That's a lot of dubbing. 
Yeah, it's like, I guess, our sort of back and forth, isn't it? Like lots of interrupting and ums and ahs and, and things rather than scripted. Yeah, exactly. Rather than scripted and just like probably, yeah, just more, more words. Um, so we actually uh, pinged YouTube and they told us we're still testing with a small group of creators and we don't have any other updates to share at this time. Hmm. But at least, you know, took the courtesy of responding. So that's YouTube. Uh, the other one was RWS. Did you hear about that? That like there was this private equity firm that was bidding for it? I think I wrote the initial story, which was when they had said that they were in talks or or not in talks they weren't in talks but there was some kind of rumor that it was it was gonna they were looking into it bearing was looking into a takeover bid for rws correct and then and then it was a four-month cliffhanger for you because you didn't check the website <laughs> yeah because i had no uh, i had no internet access or anything yeah <laughs> so well okay so we can keep this one short so long story short uh i mean it can cause quite a stir it took them four weeks to then uh, i think there's some regulatory kind of period that you have to uh, let lapse before you then say well you're bidding or you're not bidding it turns out they didn't bid there was some scrambling by hedge funds that kind of wanted to you know leverage whatever would happen to the share price because it went up and then when it announced that the bit wasn't going to happen it kind of went down again so it was just like up and then straight back to kind of its kind of long-term trend line uh but you know on our side i think it's great that rws uh, continues to be listed because it's a lot more transparent that way and we can get a lot more information that way and uh you know it seems like they're in good hands under the new ceo so um yeah so that's rws then there was this interpreter strike at the european union uh, the European Parliament, actually. But before that, we picked up on an article by interpreters at the United Nations. So you got two of the arguably largest um, buyers of interpreting services, like in the public sector, getting massive pushback by interpreters against RSI. Um, and I think at the, at the UN, it's been somewhat resolved. And they, uh, I think one of the key problems there was sound quality uh, that, you know, it's Basically, if you're remote, like somebody has a great mic, somebody has a, a really bad mic, so you jack up your volume and then like the guy with the great mic jumps in and then like, you know, the volume's like all over the place for you. Um, so that that's uh, one of the one of the issues. We also had um, Jan Rausch on the podcast for, for those who missed that one. So go check back on that podcast around just generally uh, remote simultaneous interpreting and the pros and the cons. Uh, at the European Parliament, though, I think apparently this is a long backstory. So the interpreters went on strike. Basically, they said we're not interpreting remote speakers anymore. And um, and just I mean, whatever happens in the Parliament, that's fine. But not anybody who dials in remote, right? Uh, but apparently, this is a long backstory. It's basically a dispute about working conditions. Uh, dates back to like 2018 when there was some uh, dispute around the European Parliament's administration. Um, as the interpreters say, kind of circumventing the right to strike by requisitioning interpreters. I vaguely remember we covered that. Yeah, I think I remember it at the time. And then also there was something kind of in early COVID, wasn't there, when there was some sort of strikes out of solidarity for the, the kind of contracted. Correct. So there was, yeah, so there's this long backstory. And then in 2022, um, uh, the EP staff and the freelance translators basically uh, decided to uh, go for this industrial action, like the strike, kind of because of the bad sound. So bad sound is also one part of this, but there's also apparently the European Parliament engaged a couple of interpreting agencies, which then, which then kind of alienated both. It alienated the staff interpreters who said, well, you know, <laughs> what are you trying to do here? Uh, you know, basically cut us out of the loop. And the freelancers who apparently have been had been working with the parliament directly for a long time. So the freelancers saying, well, so now you're going with agencies. Uh, so there's this pretty um, challenging mix here of like technical challenges with RSI and then like, you know, generally kind of working condition challenges. So we'll, uh, we'll follow the story. We should probably do a follow up on that one. I suppose it's a massive workforce, isn't it? Like you say, one of the biggest sort of users of interpreting. So it's, it's not surprising that sometimes there are kind of these, these types of disputes. It's hard to get right. I think when you're managing it, that at such a massive scale. Absolutely. And, and it is super critical. I mean, you, you want to be able to speak in your own language in a parliament. Like, you know, I mean, yeah, I understand English is the lingua franca, but now with uh, Brexit specifically, it's like, it's, it's a little random that people would speak English. 
because uh, it's basically, you know, there's only a few countries left, like Malta and, you know, like Ireland. Uh, all right, well, that's another story we covered a couple of times in the past. Uh, so m and news, I just pulled up our kind of database. So a lot has been happening. I think it's, it's uh, more than a dozen deals. Since April, end of April. Since yeah. like mid-April. There was a lot of activity just around the time you left. Separate Tech acquired TSD in Germany. That was their first acquisition after the Separate Tech was uh, acquired by a private equity firm. Then Top End in, uh, in London acquired Translate Media, sizable acquisition. Translated, uh, not sure how to call that or what to call that. Translated acquired Modern MT. Yeah. Modern MT is the machine translation project slash company that was, I think it was like um, funded, partially funded by the European Union, definitely uh, supported by translated.com. Is it with FBK as well? Yeah, exactly. The, the, the research institute in, in Trieste. So translated now owns Modern MT and this should be, um, you know, very helpful for them and Transline that also got investment by private equity like half a year ago, bought Mikado Innovation. Mikado, do, do you play Mikado totally uh, on a tangent here? Do you understand what, is, is that a thing in English, Mikado? Yeah, it's a stick, stick game, yeah. But I don't, it's not one of my hobbies, I have to say. <laughs> it's one of those things in like Swiss shops, like in like, in like uh, vacation regions, there's almost like a tiny Mikado set. Yeah. Is it like something you can take to the mountains and play like in your, in your kind of ski huts and things? <laughs> Precisely. It's like, you know, if you, if you don't want to do another board game, it's like Mikado, but the, it's very uh, finicky, but totally tangent. Well, anyway, so Translate acquired Mikado and Carlisle uh, spent another 15 million euros on Memsource. So helping them scale up. We didn't really know what to call this round. It was just kind of another capital injection. Um, so good for, for Memsource. And then another one is Propio. You know, remember he had Marco on the podcast. Uh, so he's on a roll. He acquired uh, Telelanguage, another um, interpreting service provider in the United States in the healthcare sector. And, you know, the whole regulatory environment there is just so favorable for interpreting providers now with the Biden administration rolling back certain things that Trump did and uh, expanding language access again. So that, that's, a, that's a good business. And he's, uh, yeah, and he's very much, uh, very much um, on a growth trajectory there. So talking about growth trajectories and the United States and healthcare and Propio, what's going on on the Inc. 5000 list? Yeah, well, I'm glad you ask. Um, so, I mean, I think we've covered this for quite a few years now, the Inc. 5000 list um, in the US. So it ranks um, the fastest growing um, provide, uh, sorry, fast growing companies in the US based on like a three year uh, revenue growth period. So this one in 2022 um, is for revenue growth between 2018 and 2021. Um, and we had 11 um, US-based LSPs um, that were included on the list in 2022. So that's more than in previous years, uh, in 2021 and 2020. Um, but yeah, some really good representation. And I mean, topping the list here, um, I think we have to mention specifically, is Boost Lingo, who actually came in at rank 312. Um, so that's out 5,000. I mean, that's pretty good going. Um, and they, I mean, yeah, they had a sort of astronomical growth over that, um, three year period of what is that? 1800% or something? 1820%. Okay. Yeah. I'm right. 1800. There you go. Um, but yeah, so they made the top, not just the top 5,000, but, uh, the top 500 of that list, um, obviously sort of founded less than a decade ago and kind of a similar story is PGLS. Um, they're also new to the list. So the first time that they've appeared on the Inc 5000 list, um, made it into the top 500 spots, um, at four, six, one. Um, and that's, uh, some people might know them from the LSPI, uh, in 2022, they were classed as a leader with around $32 million uh, in revenues. Then you've got um, well, a number of other ones also featured on the LSPI, such as Language Network, which came in at 1,816. Um, they're a boutique LSP with around 5 million 
in revenues. Um, then you've got also, uh, well, Propio, as we said, as a leader, um, further down the list than the others around um, 3,212 um, revenues of 33.2 million in 2021. Um, obviously, I think we've said this before, it's harder to make the list as you grow bigger. So the bigger you are, almost the harder it is because you have to, you know, grow that much further, faster, whatever. Um, but yeah, good representation, I'd say, across the board. Some small, some some larger ones. Um, got Ericsson Translation, for example, that was back on the list this year. So they were, I think, quite a regular fixture on the list um, around 20, uh, 2007 to 2010. Um, and they're a challenger in the LSPI um, at around 8 million. Um, so they're back on the list in 2022. CQ Fluency, um, kind of ninth time, apparently, in a row that they've been on this list. Um, so that's, you know, quite a good, quite a good performance from them there. Um, some others that are also featured on previous Inc. 5000 lists, like Blue Digital Group. We had um, the Legal Translation International Trade Specialist, um, the Translate, the Spanish Group. Sorry, they're also back on the list again. Propio, we said, um, and FIPS Reporting also back on the list as a Legal Language Services Specialist. So yeah, congrats to uh, to everybody and keep it going. Absolutely. We'll check back in in 2023. And now we're heading over to Adrian Probst from Freelanceverse to learn how we can 10x or 100x the amount of subscribers and viewers we get for this podcast. And welcome back to SlaterPod, everyone. Joining us today is Adrian Probst, German language specialist and the creator behind the YouTube channel Freelance Verse. Hi, Adrian. Hello, Florian. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for joining us today. So where does this podcast find you today? What country, what city? I'm in Brussels, Belgium. Just came back from a stint in Switzerland, but now I'm back in Belgium where I live. Cool, cool. So you're a fellow Swiss, but you live in Belgium. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Many people here ask me, why would you leave Switzerland? Not many people understand, but you know, life takes you places. Yeah, Belgium is a great place to be too, uh, especially the Brussels area is very nice. So first tell us how you get to 16,000 subscribers on YouTube and create videos with like 70,000 views uh, uh, as a freelance translator. How, how does that happen? I want to know the secret. To get an audience online, I would say the, the two things you need is consistency and uh, authenticity, right? That's what I hear always again and again. Like, if you really want to build up a channel, you need to do it consistently. If you really want to go insane, you can do it daily. I don't recommend, but <laughs> you can if you want to, but I, I opted for weekly. And then just stick to it. I mean, I, I take a summer break just for my, for my sanity and to not like have something without an end goals. but. Apart from my summer break, I upload every Monday at 6 p.m. And that's, I think, very important if you want to build something. And in terms of 70K views for a video, that's that's really arbitrary. I think like sometimes uh, some videos take off and do really well and others don't. I don't really know the secret yet, but I think usually like when you take a question that many people are asking themselves, like how do you start a, a new job how do you make a lot of money with something so something that is in people's minds and then you offer a well-executed video with a lot of answers and in a lot of languages preferably a lot of subtitling on youtube helps a lot to to gain viewership um, so the videos with the most views on my channel are interesting questions with hopefully well-executed videos with a lot of subtitles subtitles meaning you're you have like 10 five or 10 languages as a subtitle option? Yeah, I mean, the, my biggest video has like 26 languages on there. It's, it's insane. Like People are really keen on, I, I offered this at the beginning of, of doing this channel. I offered it always. Like I told people you can get in touch with me and uh, subtitle my videos if you want to. YouTube made it a bit more difficult. It used to be super easy. They could just go on the channel and add subtitles themselves without any involvement from me. But of course, if you make anything avail available to the public, you know how it ends, like just random racial slurs would be on anyone's videos and stuff. So YouTube had to do anything, something against it and they made it much more difficult to do it. 
It is still possible. It just has to be done manually. So people have to get in touch with me. I have to send them the file to do it. They send it back. I upload it. A much bigger uh, effort. And then for a while I had to disable it because I didn't have time to accommodate for all the requests. But now I have someone working for me and she took over this, uh, this task. So now it's open again and people can subtitle my videos. I'm taking notes, do subtitles. Um, although, I mean, like as a translator or translation, uh, you know, news outlet, like we, like it's, uh, we, we have probably the more critical audience when it comes to any errors or mistakes in, in the subtitles, I guess. So. But let's go back to a bit of your professional background and your kind of route into the translation industry. Tell us a bit more about that. How, how did this come about? Yeah, so I always uh, was very good in languages in school and very bad in anything else. So I knew that I need to pursue some kind of uh, profession in this area. And uh, as you know, in Switzerland, we have an amazing educational system. So I, I went the, the normal path. I got my uh, high school degree and then I did an apprenticeship and I went into commercial apprenticeship. So I, I had the idea that I would just uh, work in business. I, I was working in an export firm that was making big machineries. So I went kind of this traditional way and I thought I was very happy with it. That was not the issue, but I didn't have a clear plan of what my goal was professionally. And then when my grades were sufficient enough to actually think about university, because that was never on my radar, none of my family members ever went to uni. So this was kind of a, yeah, I was not exposed to this option. Right. And then I realized, okay, there, there might be an option there. And I looked through the whole, um, a list of possible studies in Switzerland and I found translation, which was one of the only ones, to be honest, that was really focused on languages. And uh, that's the first time that I actually was encountered with this profession. I, I obviously had, uh, I knew that people translate things, but I didn't know that it's an actual profession to do. And I got intrigued and I moved away from my very small Bernice village to, to Winterthur, to the canton of Zurich. And this was a huge step for me, but there I did my translation studies. And since then I was sure that something would happen in the industry. I just, in the university, they don't really teach you how to be a freelancer. It's kind of brushed away, uh, only like really at the end of my studies, we had a freelancer as a teacher and, or as a professor. And that was the first time that I was kind of introduced to this world. Um, so then I ended up working in a translation agency in Switzerland and I thought I could just work my way up there to eventually become more involved in the language, uh, and, or in the localization workflow. I was really a, strictly a project manager that time for two years. Um, yeah, then I wanted to, do a master, wanted to do a master's after that. I went to the Netherlands and that's when I started as a side business to finance my masters, to translate, uh, on a freelance basis, found my very first client, which was a direct client. And, uh, it went from there and none of these clients are my clients anymore now, but that's a normal, uh, normal uh, process, I think. And that was in 2016. And since then I've been building this business and, uh, still very happy with it. It's great. So you mentioned that, um, like you started kind of slowly, gradually during your translation studies, the DMA, like what was some of the initial challenge of kind of breaking into this like super hyper competitive market, right? I mean, there's, um, and then how did you find your first clients? And then like, what's kind of your client uh, set at the beginning and, and now? Yeah, I think the one benefit for me was that I never made the decision to, you know, like, okay, now I'm becoming a freelance translator. This was never the intention. I was just, uh, faced with the fact that I had money saved for my MA and, uh, it was slowly running out and I got really anxious that only money is going out and nothing is coming in. So I thought before I, I go out and look for a student's job, I, I have an education. I might just put it to use, you know? And, uh, so I signed up with platforms like pros.com, translators cafe, all the usual suspects. And I was just really, really lucky. I, I, I applied to a few of them to a few job positions I found on there and, um, an English or a British, um, shoe company contacted me and they, for some, I mean, you need to be really lucky, right? They needed, a uh, they wanted a German translator for Belgium and I was living in the Netherlands and there is a really small, um, community in Belgium speaking German, right? And 
I mean, I was kind of aware of that, but this is not a, a very well-known community. So I looked up what they actually speak, what they write like, and uh, it turns out they have a very similar grammar to Germany. There is not much to that you need to actually do to change. So I accepted this job. I don't think I would do that today, but I was just uh, <laughs> thinking, why not? This is my first day with job. So I did that. And then from then on, I... I uh, yeah, th there was really no big pressure on me, you know, like any kind of euros or francs or dollar, whatever I made then was already more than I expected. So I think it's much harder when people put the pressure on them and maybe quit the job and then th say, okay, I'm, I need to make this work. And next week or next month, I need to be a freelance translator. That's much harder to do than just doing something on the side. That's the, the advice I always give to people. Don't just quit your job. Try to reduce your hours. Try to do a study next to it and kind of build your way up. Because then by the end of my master's, I was working maybe 40, 50% as a, as a freelancer, not only translation, but as just as a language expert. And then was the, actually the point when I made the decision to become a translator. Before it was just a side job and that helped me a lot. Um, back then it was uh, mostly not very well paid, uh, agency jobs. <laughs> I just, and I really, I don't know how I did it back then. I, I worked crazy hours because obviously I did the full-time master and just in during the night and the weekend, I was working on this stuff. Uh, so it was very intense. Couldn't do that anymore, but I was still young then, I guess. And then I had to make use of these incredible working hours. Of course, don't recommend it, but some things just need to be done in the beginning, I guess, to make it work. Whenever people now ask me uh, if it's healthy to work 12, 13 hours, I say, no, it's not. You shouldn't do it. But maybe in the beginning, there's no other way, right? So, and then, yeah, my clientele really changed completely. Uh, I still work mostly with agencies. That's just a preference of mine. Uh, I like to have a split of like 70, 80% agencies and 20, 30% direct clients. I know many people have different opinions, but for me, the, the productivity is just much higher. The hassle is much less with, with agencies and I can be, I think I can be more productive and make more money with a split like this, but that's also personality, uh, wise. Then when you, uh, work 12, 13 hours and you gradually came back to a normal level, you decided, Hey, you know, now I'm like, uh, have normal hours. Let me become a YouTube creator and ramp this up to 12 hours again. Or what was the thought process there? This was an idea that happened in the first lockdown, uh, March, April, 2020. Uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. I was bored. I needed a new challenge. Uh, couldn't leave the house. So, uh, this was, I mean, it was always kind of on my mind that I want to do something like this, but I needed to gain the relevant experience first, of course. And it was kind of the perfect moment to start this really. It gave me motivation. It gave me purpose. And I, I did a lot of reflection in this time. And the kind of the only thing that I missed from my life was kind of having, having a, an impact on other people's lives is something that really gives me a lot of purpose when I can help others. And uh, I was thinking, how can I do this professionally or personally? And of course, there are many different ways, but I'm also really in love with the whole YouTube game. So I knew that I would be good in this. And so, yeah, I, I gave myself the challenge to make one video a week for an entire year and see where this takes me. So the plan was to start on the first week of July, 2020, finish first week of July, 2021. And I did that for an entire year and managed to gain like 4,000 subscribers and really committed community, people waiting every Monday for my videos and just gave me so much and uh, really like, opened so many doors as well. We, I'm sure we will talk about this later on, what this, what this led to this whole thing. And I realized I, I can't stop now. I mean, there is actually viable possibility to turn this into something not only like, it's not about money, right? But if it comes with a monetary value, that's even better. Right? So, uh, and since then I've been going and now it's already season three happening and I don't intend to stop. I still have many ideas, but yeah, you're right. I, I'm working again way too much. <laughs> Yeah, you're super uh, open about it as well. I, I watch one of your videos where you like walk people through how you monetize this and like uh, pull up the numbers from YouTube, which was super interesting. Because I think we, 
we just hit that 1k mark where we theoretically could monetize that stuff but i mean obviously with our 500 to a thousand views per show I, I don't think it's uh it makes a lot of sense uh, uh for us to get a few nickels there but um so maybe just like for you this is like a a big kind of side project or probably by now main project but how how important to you think is kind of online visibility for a freelancer like let's assume they don't want to spend you know 20 hours a week but like like what do you suggest they do how important is it and then um how is it maybe maybe give give them some example how it has helped your translation business uh thrive what you're doing i mean online visibility especially as a freelance translator maybe not in all freelance uh professions but as a freelance translator it's everything in my opinion it's it's how you get noticed. If you're not visible online, no one will hire you, right? There is really no offline. Well, there are offline options to find clients. Of course, you can go to like events and uh, like chamber of commerce uh, introduction sessions and stuff. You can do that, but most people don't do it, or most. Or it's very hard to find clients that way. So online visibility is everything. And people ask me sometimes, like, what what's the benefit of you? like being visible to other people in the industry that do the same thing as you, like, what's the point? Because the clients will not see these videos. Right. But I don't agree with that at all, because the point is that everything works now at, at my stage, everything works, works through recommendations, right? I, I never go out to find new clients anymore. This, everything is based on other people's rec recommendations and this has been, um, networking has not always been easy for me and it still is not easy. Like when I go to a real life event, I struggle with actually just approaching people out of the blue. I'm getting better now, but it's definitely something that is tough for people. And I, I hear that many people say, I'm an, I'm a translator for a reason. I'm an introvert. I don't go out to talk to people. Like how do I network? Right. <laughs> and people are believing that I'm an introvert as well. And it doesn't, I mean, there's a reason I. I make videos in front of a camera and then upload them, right? And I don't go out to speak in front of audiences. Um, there's a way for anyone to to do networking, but of course, not everyone needs to make YouTube videos. Just find your own niche, find your own maybe, I don't know, maybe an idea that you can post weekly on LinkedIn about your language or something, just something that's, that sets you apart from other people. We have such an amazing community on LinkedIn uh, of, of freelance translators that push each other, that support each other. I think it's, it's really amazing. And if you can be noticed there as someone, like you, you need to find your kind of special thing, right? For me, the special thing that I promote is that I'm a German translator for Switzerland, but not living in Switzerland. So that gives me kind of the opportunity to not having to charge horrendous Swiss prices, but I can, of course, but I don't have to, I have this option. And a lot of people then think, yeah, they rather look for someone abroad for someone that knows the Swiss audience. And that's the, the, that's how I try to market myself. And if you find this special thing from you, then people will recognize you. They will remember you. So if someone posts now on LinkedIn, any kind of job for a Swiss German translator, editor, proofreader. I will get tagged like three, four times and it's amazing. And people tag me all the time and I, I don't really have time to take on all these jobs. But even if, just if I had uh, the opportunity, I could just find jobs based on recommendations by now. Right. And of course, if you're not visible, no one will recommend you. So for me, online visibility, number one thing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, networking, let's call it, uh, is the number one thing, but that is kind of the same for me because when you are visible online people will reach out to you and you will get to know people and i think what i'm also sensing from you is that uh, consistency is key right i mean it's kind of the same for us like we're trying to really put out one podcast a week like we're not always I, we're not religious about it but like you have to be consistent and not like do one and then like wait for three months and come back I mean, you can do that if the if the content is super, super high quality, but I think just consistency is, is important. Also on LinkedIn, right? I mean, you want to be regularly present is, is what I'm sensing from you. And then having a kind of a good USP, like unique selling point, like just a, kind of a good profile. That's what I was looking for, yeah. But back to kind of the balancing the time. Um, because, yeah, I mean, if you're like Mr. Beast or whatever, some 
top YouTube creator. Yeah, you can probably live off of YouTube, but like, how do you balance like what you're doing on YouTube and your translation work? Like, is it just, okay, I've allocated this specific budget per week in, in terms of hours to YouTube, and then I'll, I'll do work like translation work, um, after that, or like, how do you, yeah. How do you balance the two? Cause you could, you could be working on paid work as well during the, uh, the YouTube hours, I guess. Exactly. Uh, that would be ideal what you said, but that's not the case. No, <laughs> the priority is on the business, right? So the, the YouTube has been and should be a side project. Um, I go about my usual day. I, I do my business. I sometimes I'm very overwhelmed. I work only on my translation business or language business, and I have no time to even look at YouTube. I spend about one working day a week on it. I would say about seven, eight hours a week I spend on it. Um, it's mostly evenings. It's, it's over lunch. It's before I start working. It's Saturday mornings. You know, it's just. Whenever I find the time and whenever it feels easy to do, I don't want this to feel like a burden. I want this to be a hobby. I, I, I enjoy doing it, especially when I have a good video idea. I get very excited about it. I, I film, edit, upload it all in one session. Um, some videos I'm not very excited about, but they just need to be made. Like that's, that's also like a balance when you, when you make regular videos, you will not enjoy all of them, but some you just need to make because people are requesting them. And there it's, it's tougher to make them. And I notice my motivation is lower. And then I also postpone things. Um, in general, the balance of work is kind of easy still for me to do now. Uh, now, now I have help. I have someone now uh, helping with the channel management and with social media, because that's something I don't want to have anything to do with. Um, I know that there is so much potential in promotion, especially on social media, but it, this is, yeah, I, I can't deal with that. So I, I hired someone to, to do that for me and that helps a lot. So I don't need to worry about that. In terms of production, whenever I have an idea and have some time, I do it. So I, I don't have strict hours when I, when I do what, no, it just feels, comes natural. Now for next Monday, I don't have anything yet because it haven't felt it hasn't felt natural yet. So hopefully tomorrow or, or, or Saturday, something will come to mind. Get some inspiration. Yeah. Usually I'm like two weeks ahead, but not at the moment. Yeah, I can relate. It's not, it's not easy to come up with fresh topics every time. Uh, talking about topics, like you, you've been, uh, talking about pricing and, and kind of financial and earning like related, um, issues on, on um, on your videos, like. This is a very hot topic, of course, among many freelancers. And we, we just our last, uh, the, the most recent podcast we had uh, was, was talking about translation pricing. What was the feedback or is the feedback like for you when you tackle these issues that few in the translation industry want to discuss openly, I guess, but you're super open. So have you gotten a lot of pushback, a lot of kind of encouragement? What was the feedback like? Yeah, the, I could still be more open. I think I'm sharing everything except for my actual rates and revenue. I don't want to have this publicly online, but I tell everyone you can reach out to me. We can talk privately and then I will be open to share everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I share my principles. I share that I would never work, as, but of course that's language specific, but in the German language industry, I would never work for less than 10 cents a word. That's kind of my my minimum and I tell that to people and then they, they get upset and they say, yeah, but that's unfair because you work with German and we have no options in Spanish or in on, yeah Arabic or whatever. And yeah, I know that, but that's also what I'm trying to say with my channel all the time. Like take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Like I'm not trying to be this know-it-all guru who just tells you how, how this industry works, right? I'm just sharing my knowledge. Of course, I don't know everything and I know one specific language. So I, I try to like lower the expectations from people when they, when they just say, oh, please help me. I need to survive. I need a job and stuff. And it can get really tough because I, I get no messages with all these really tough, uh, you know, life stories and they, they put all their hopes into me suddenly and of course, I can't help them from here, right? They, they need a, a mentor in their own language pair to to build them up. So I'm trying the best I can do, but I need to lower expectations sometimes. Uh, in terms of pushback, no, I haven't haven't had any pushback. Sometimes uh, people are, are upset when I don't actually share. Like I, I always do a yearly roundup of my numbers, right? And 
there I share everything except for my actual yearly revenue and people are upset because they would actually like to hear them. Uh, then I tell them, please get in touch with me and we can talk. I don't want to share this because, you know, these videos stay up probably for a lifetime and I don't want, uh, I need to be more conscious of what's out there. And um, yeah, but no, no pushback. I'm really open. Like, I think that's a, a stigma that also happens in non-freelancer positions, like right? people don't really want to share their salaries, but uh, it's always strange when I see in job postings. Deep in our Swiss soul, not to share salaries, is it? Yeah, that is actually true. And that, uh, well, in many regards, I, I tell people tell me that I'm not Swiss. I guess that's another aspect of it. But yeah, I, I find it weird in job postings, people say, uh, we have a competitive uh, salary package, but then why don't you say what it is? Why do you, uh, like, if it's so competitive, why can't you just share it? I find it strange sometimes. I think in the UK, they post salaries as kind of a matter of course. Um, let, let's talk about another uh, kind of hot, button topic uh, is that you had a video, I think the fear of machine translation, you talked about that. And can, so can we talk a bit about post editing and like, do you do a lot of post editing? If, if yes, what are the pros and the cons and like, where do you see this all going? Yeah, that, that was a very important uh, video on my channel. It's called, Will AI Steal Our Jobs? And it is uh, addressing the fear of machine translation. This was by far one of the most uh, um, requested video. So I, I put a lot of effort in, I put, uh, I was researching a lot and I also did my BA and my MA, uh, thesis, both, on, uh, surrounding machine translation in the broadest sense. So I have some knowledge in it. Um, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's coming. There is really <laughs> nothing to, to sweet talk about it. It's, it's. Uh, necessary that that especially freelance translators are getting accustomed to it are knowing about the the topic uh, you mentioned machine translation post editing me personally i don't offer it well i offer it but i don't work in it uh, that much because my clients are not using it yet but i have been using it before and i don't really have a problem with it my thing is just i i judge it by the hour because then for me it's just like a normal proofreading in a way uh, I don't like when companies uh, take advantage of it and then really charge very low rates because some outputs can be extremely bad and then it's almost like a retranslation, right? So it, it's really ripping up some translators. But of course, I'm aware that there are very highly domain-specific MT engines, like let's say healthcare or sport-related that are really fed with a, with a theme and then they become very, very good, right? So it's I just charge it as a normal proofreading and when you have a good relationship with your client, they will understand that. So the jobs that I got so far were, uh, were that like this and they were perfectly fine. I didn't have any problem with that. Um, yeah, in terms of to answer the question of the video, whether it will steal our jobs, I mentioned in the video, the short answer is yes, but the short answer to that is also that, or the long answer is also that this will happen to any profession, in my opinion. And um, there is a really important distinction to make there between what is actually the, the job of a translator, of an educated, well-trained human translator, I don't like the word, but yeah, uh, versus a machine translation, right? Because there's so much content and, and text produced nowadays, like incredible amounts. And there's so much crap out there that you don't want a human translator to work on, right? We don't need human translation of so much uh, data. What we need to focus on is like user, like uh, consumer facing and actually creative texts that are important and, and not just any data for internal use. You can use, use machine translation for that. So our job is to position ourselves in a way that we are the creatives, we are the well-trained experts, the language specialists. Uh, I refrain now to call myself a translator most of the times. So I call myself a, either a language consultant or a language specialist because I do so much more than translating, right? And I think my clients realize that and my audience as well, and it, it has helped them a lot, I think. You mentioned that you're actually getting a fair amount of... Um... Not a fair amount that you get most of your con uh, the work that you get is not post editing. So the perception now is that almost anything can be machine translated quite well if you kind of have the right engine and you train it and blah, blah, blah. So 
what type of content do you get and why isn't it pre-translated? Is it because the agency is just not there yet? The client doesn't request it? You could, in theory, machine translate it if you kind of did everything right? Or does the text itself simply just not lend, lend uh, itself to a machine translation? Yeah, most of it is that. Most of it is just... Uh... And too creative to uh, transliteral translations and uh, like you really have to localize a text for an audience, for a Swiss audience, German audience, Austrian audience, whatever it is. Uh, there is also a cost factor, right? Uh, smaller companies, smaller agencies are not able to buy a highly specialized, highly domain-specific engine. And they are also not specialized in a specific domain most of the time. They work in different domains, so you would have to have different engines for different domains. Um, I think the price is just too high at the moment still for this uh, large-scale integration. But theoretically, yes, you're right. It could happen. You just need a lot of training um, material and you need a lot of funds to, to do that. Um, but most of the texts that I do are... Well, I do a lot of subtitling. I don't know if I mentioned that. That's one of my biggest services. And I don't know. I don't... I mean, you could... You could uh, have it transcribed by someone and then machine translate it. Yeah, you could do that. But I haven't had any machine translation for subtitling yet, for example. I don't know what's the hold back there. Um, but I often do subtitling from people speaking Swiss German. And I think that's a, a big benefit for me because any transcription or machine translation software would not pick up all the dialects, as you know. And that kind of keeps me afloat as well. So they speak Swiss German in all the beautiful dialects we have, and then you transcribe it into like high German or? Exactly. I have a lot of like intern, internal communication videos from Swiss companies that, you know, especially during COVID had to do all their um, company meetings, annual assemblies online, right? So they did a lot of video content speaking Swiss German. I then transcribed it to high German and then someone has translated it to French, Italian. So there, there is a lot of content in that regard, yeah. Yeah, and then just a lot of website, very consumer-facing website content that you, you could uh, machine translate, but it's happened. It depends so much w what the context context is, right? If if it's really a headline on a website, you can't just machine translate it and then like send it. You need the the whole context of the of the campaign. Maybe just on a personal note, are you one of those people that like, if you need to edit one or two things, you're like, well, I just scratch the whole translation and start from, from, from scratch again. Or do you kind of, do you like to edit or do you like to just kind of start from scratch and do your own thing when something's not great? Tough question. It really depends on what the client wants and what they pay, right? If they pay me to actually produce a proper uh, translation that is not looking translated, then I will need to start from scratch, right? But then they, they need to pay by the hour. But if I was tasked with a per word post editing job, I would not start from scratch because then you can't make any money. You, you just, you work for like 10 bucks an hour or so, which is fine in some com countries, of course, but not where I live. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, I, I'm sensitive that my knowledge of this, like the act of knowledge is dating because we, you know, during my days of translation, I we never did any post editing. It just didn't make sense at the time. It was just so bad. Um, so I don't know how I'd react. It's interesting to hear from you. Um, let, let's switch tack a bit to YouTube again. And um, like we recently covered a story where there's like this beta trial going on and YouTube's giving like some of the top creators uh, the option to add multilingual audio uh, uh, tracks, right? So Mr. Beast, for example, I keep using Mr. Beast, but like we know that he has it. Um, so he, you can actually sway, <laughs> you can switch the audio to, I think sometimes he has like Hindi, Spanish, French, uh, and, and, and so it's not actually uh, AI dubbing, it's like proper professional dubbing. So it's, you know, it's like on Netflix or, or Disney plus. So, but it's in beta trial, check it out. Uh, just go to Mr. Beast. He has a few videos there like that. And I mean, the headline of our story was like, this is kind of a Netflix sized, uh, opportunity because, you know, if they rolled this out across the platform, you'd have a huge boost of demand for 
a translation and then of course dubbing as well right now i mean what do you think about that is that something you you do if they wrote this out to more creators because you know you're you're big account now i mean you could probably get some type of if they rolled it out beyond like better you, you probably would be among the accounts who could benefit from that would, is that something you do or probably yeah they they usually roll out things for channels above 10k subscribers that's kind of the trash mark for all their products and features that's really interesting yeah what i thought when you mentioned this first was that they have a lot of uh, second and third and fourth channels in different languages i know that mr beast has a mr beast espanol for example where he did the same thing but just on a different channel but now you say in the actual video they can switch the language that's amazing like i haven't heard of this uh that's very interesting i wonder like if it's then user generated or if the creator has to add it actually it just it sounds pro this is like professional dubbing or like not dubbing dubbing like not lip sync but like voiceover kind of time synced um yeah i guess for lack of a better word dubbing yeah. that's really cool i mean that that would be um, for me you know it's I, I have so much I want to do with this channel, but of course it's not generating enough revenue yet to actually justify hiring multiple people, right? Uh, with the translation that people want to do on a voluntary basis there, I say, yes, please, if you really want to do and uh, practice the craft and do it and write it in your CVs and LinkedIn as an experience, it definitely helps you to start out. But something like professional dubbing, of course, you would have to pay the, the people that help you with that. And at the moment, that's not feasible. But yeah, if if the channel is growing, why not? I mean, that's, of course, a huge benefit. Like, we still uh, expect people to just understand English around the globe, but it's it's still not the case, right? There's still so many people that, especially, like, a lot of my audience understands kind of when I speak very slowly and, you know, normally active vocabulary. But then when it comes to, for example, the video about machine translation, I went back and explained a bit what is NMT, what is SMT, what's the difference. And all these abbreviations, people don't know what it means and it goes too quickly, right? So a lot of people actually wrote in the comments, please add English subtitles of what you're saying so we can actually follow it. Uh, and th that helps them a lot already. And there is a feature on YouTube that you can just automatically subtitle it, but it's not it's not good enough, especially abbreviations. It will never pick off pick up. So I, I let it run through and then I do actually post it in a way and I, I uh, correct my actual transcript and so people can follow along in English. That is already uh, a nice accessibility feature, I think. But yeah, cool, cool beta thing. I, I'm curious where this takes them. I'm really contemplating now doing the multilingual subtitling as well. I mean, if people are keen to do this and, um, you know, find it interesting, I mean, obviously like your conversations, our conversations for translators actually hopefully are beneficial just from the content side. So they, they would learn something if they deeply, um, kind of went into this. Oh, I can guarantee you it's so useful when, when, when the first guy on my biggest video put the Arabic subtitles on, you could see my analytics just spiking up. <laughs> it's, it's really healthy, especially in, in markets like Arabic speaking, when you have subtitles, because they also uh, translate the title and the description of the video, right? And then if, if someone has the settings of YouTube in Arabic, then it will just show up as an Arabic video, like the title is already Arabic. And and uh, in their in their ui you know what i mean so they don't even know that it's a, a subtitled video so they will click it and then they will be hooked and stay there so let's wrap this by uh maybe giving a piece of advice to uh graduate students right you've uh, you said you kind of gradually uh transitioned to uh, freelance work and then to the youtube channel but like if you're a graduate student in in translation in 2022 2023 what, what piece of advice would you give uh graduates uh, how to kind of break into the industry and, and kind of make their first mark yeah my advice that i always give is do not wait until you graduate that's that's insane. I did that and I can't believe I did that. You are literally studying three, four years and you don't, if you already know that you want to become a freelance translator, that's not sure. Of course, you can be whatever you want after that. But if you're already studying for many years and you're waiting until you graduate, you're missing out on so many valuable uh, experiences, uh, potential first, you know, first clients, first uh, networking events. Um, 
yeah, your first year in the industry is not going to be easy. So you don't want it to be full time. I can tell you that. So once you start uh, your, your studies or if you're already in the studies and you know, you want to pursue freelancing, start now already, like build a portfolio, do volunteer translations, go to charities, uh, build a network, talk to people on LinkedIn, attend events, watch videos like this. And then you can, whenever you watch something, you should reach out to the people that are in it. So if you're watching this, I expect you to reach out to me and uh, so we can talk. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's really what, what makes the difference. I know that I did none of these things and I know that maybe you're not in the right headspace when you're a student, you have other priorities, I understand, uh, but I can tell you, even if you already put in 10% of the work while you're studying, it will help you so much and you will be ahead, be ahead of your competition. That would be my advice. Thanks so much, Adrian, and thanks for giving us all these uh, great tips. We're really going to uh, experiment with the subtitles on, on Slater's channel, and hopefully we're going to get a few more hundred subscribers. Probably not going to hit your 16K, but, uh, you know, every, every, everyone's helpful. So hit the subscribe button, guys. Yes, I will send as many people over as I can. Thanks so much. Take care, Adrian. Thanks.